Hi, welcome to Astrology for Gan Traders. My name is Olga Morales and I haven't produced one of these um, YouTube videos for a while. So um, here I am back and today's topic is sunspots. I've decided to do it on sunspots because I've had I've been able to access some data and also some commodity data for cotton that's going back to 1791. So I wanted to test out this um, uh, theory that has been proposed. Um, and to hopefully you enjoy it. Now, GAN was also, uh, the other fact is, is that GAN obviously was very interested in astro weather forecasting um, because we, um, in, in terms of um, forecasting commodity cycles, anything that grows in the earth is going to be affected by weather patterns and obviously flooding and drought. And that's what the ancient astrologers were very good at because their survival depended on it. So, um, you know, he had a book by a forecaster called W.T. Foster entitled Sunspots and Weather. And it was also, um, he had a newsletter. I'll just go to the next slide. Um, W.T. Foster, he was actually called the weather prophet in the papers at the time. Here's a little snippet out of um, his uh, one of his pamphlets. Our sunspots and weather pamphlet was delayed a few days but now it's being distributed. It is our most important paper and absolutely proves planetary influences to be a fact. Jupiter is the king of the planetary system in sunspots and weather. By it we prove that the, uh, the most sunspots occur when Jupiter is near 102 degrees of the sun's longitude, the place where the Earth is about the 1st of January. Now just to let you know, the Jupiter cycle is 11.86 years, um, rounded off to 12 years. Now let's have a look at this. He's telling us that it's um, that point is when the Earth is closest to the sun in January. So we know that the Earth's orbit is elliptical. So there's times when the Earth is closer to the Sun and also there's times when it's further away from the Sun. Okay. Now when it's aphelion, a helion comes from Greek for helios is the Sun. When it's further away, this occurs in July or the 4th of July, the Sun is at 13 Cancer, which is 103. When it's perihelion, when it's closest to the uh, Sun, the Earth's closest to the Sun, that occurs early in January, around the 3rd, and the Sun is 13 Capricorn, 283. Now remember, the Sun and the Earth are always opposite in the heavens, okay? So let's have a look at this. The Earth's perihelion, which is around the 3rd of, of January. This is what uh, Foster was talking about in his quote. Now let's have a look at where the Earth is. The Earth is always a circle with a cross. And the sun is a circle with a, um, a circle with a dot. Okay, so let's have a look at this axis. This is a 360 dial, and have a look at the Earth. We start anything at 90 degrees, we know we're into the Cancer, and then after 270, we know we're into the Capricorn area. So they're always opposite. What I want you to look at, what I've done is uh, around the dial, uh, this circle, I've put the um, positions of the uh, fixed stars. Not all of them, or else it'd be too much stuff, but. Basically, I just want you to um, see what where the Earth is lined up with at that point is with a um, fixed star called Sirius. Okay, it's very serious to the Egyptians, and I'll explain why. And then the Sun was actually at that time connected to a fixed star called Vega, which again will become important uh, as I progress. Now, what I've done here is the Earth's aphelion, which is the 4th of July. I've actually shown you um, the same thing, but on a 90 degree dial, um, remembering that the first third is the cardinal area, the second is all the fixed, and the third is all the mutable. Now, the fact that those stars are in Cancer and Capricorn, obviously they're going to come together uh, in this dial. And so is, is the Sun and the Earth, because anything opposite or square or conjunct will come together. So here we have this point, sort of just sort of the middle point of the cardinal signs where we have these stars and the Sun um, and the Earth. Okay. Now, Sirius, just to bring some um, ancient um, wisdom into it as well, because part of decoding Gan and, and the Bible is understanding how the ancients um, treated these fixed stars um, and they're encoded um, as uh, events and people and they had their um, gods uh, represented as these stars. Okay, so 
Um, the brightest star Sirius is very special to the Egyptians and it was the hottest days of the year occurred when the dog star was lost behind the sun's glare. The ancients believed that Sirius added heat to the sun. It was actually called the um, scorcher. So the hottest days of summer were called the dog days after Sirius. So that's where we get the dog days. Okay. The helical rising of Sirius, that means it's just rising before the sun. It also coincided with the flooding of the Nile. And that's what they were waiting for, you know. Um, and that would save their crops from um, for another year. Um, so, basically, the um, Sirius aside and the Halakha rising of Sir, um, Sirius was actually the new year for the Egyptians. Okay, so it's very special. Now, it's um, interesting that the 4th of July, American independence, the sun on that day is around 13 degrees of, of Cancer. Okay, now if you have a look, Sirius at the time in 1776 was um, approximately at 11 degrees of Cancer. Now I won't go into too much, but um, the positions of the fixed stars do change over time because of something called the precession of the equinoxes, which is one degree every 72 years. Okay, so they're slowly moving. Um, well it's not, they're not moving, the orientation of the way we see them is moving, okay. So um, it's interesting like if, if you consider, um, if I can find where that star is, yeah Polaris is our current pole star, okay. That's basically the north point when we look up and that's our pole star at the moment. But a long, long time ago, Vega, which is opposite was the pole star so it's just and that was probably about 14,000 years ago would have done a complete flip um, when these stars were so you can imagine why it's very difficult sometimes to uncode things because we need to understand how these stars were uh, arranged um, in terms of, of the people what they were seeing rising and setting and culminating that has changed over time so the myths change um, and so that's that's one of the interesting parts of um, understanding the procession of the equinoxes. Okay. Now another thing that I found reading um, Bill Meridian's book Planetary Economic Forecasting is this thing called the invariable plane. I never heard about it before. And at 13, 14, Cancer Capricorn is the invariable plane. Charles Jane frequently referred to this axis, which was first discovered by the astronomer Pierre Simon Laplace. This place is independent of the mutable agitations of the planets. It is a plane where the velocities of the planets net out to zero. And you can read more about what Bill's found about that plane. But I just thought it was so amazing when I was researching this, that this plane comes in um, um, to do with sunspots as well and Jupiter's cycle. Now, just to bring in some of Gan's um, work as well, we've got this horoscope that he had, which is I've shown before many times. But the sensor is um, Columbus sighting of America. Then we have independ American independence. And then we have two CBOT uh, natal charts, which is the Chicago Board of Trade. And then on the outside, he's got all the conjunctions and oppositions of the planets. Basically, this is what I've replicated here. And what I wanted to show you quickly is this invariable plane, which is basically the Cancer Capricorn axis, comes up in all four of these charts. So you can see where, um, when you're working with the cycles, you need to know these um, points of the zodiac that um, they share. So you can make some interesting, you can do some interesting um, research and analysis to see how they have um, worked in the past. Okay. So let's have a look what I've been able to do because I've got this amazing data and uh, software that I can I can do all this with. This is timing solution. Um, I've, I've been able to test the Jupiter cycle for cotton. And so this is basically um, Jupiter going through the zodiac. And now this is a lot because I've got this back from 1791 and it's been able to do almost 24 cycles of this to give me the statistical uh, trend for and basically if you see these red spots here that's showing you that um, those areas have um, high statistical um, and uh, what's what I know the exact word for it but there's more um, synchronicity at that point okay so it's but it's and it um, links up with the cancer Capricorn axis okay this is what they've been 
talking about with sunspots. So what I was able to do as well, um, I've got the sunspots on down below here in red and the green bars is when Jupiter is with Vega and then that's supposed to relate to sunspot minima and then the blue is with Sirius and that's the sunspot maxima, that's what Foster was talking about. Okay, so you can see and you can study this um, yourself with um, any commodity you would like to have a look at how um, it has affected the um, supply and demand of whatever commodity you're interested in. Okay, now the Timing Solutions allows you to test um, the efficiency of these um, points, um, something called the efficiency test which um, Bill Meridian was the brainchild of. Um, and basically it's telling me that when Jupiter's with Sirius there's a 74% uh, downtrend for cotton. So this is how you can do some statistical analysis for these um, uh, phenomena, phenomena um, of the planetary alignments. Now drought and floods. The other thing I found amazing is that um, the, the research of an Australian uh, long-range forecaster called Inigo Jones had similar findings. Now he found that when Jupiter um, is with Sirius which coincided with sunspot maximum there was more flooding and when with Vega the sunspot minimum more drought in Australia. So this is Australian conditions but he found the same spots in the cosmos to be related to those things which is amazing <laughs> when you think about it you know we've got um, people from different places and different eras getting the same information so historically also and statistically there's more major economic contractions and recessions peak with sunspot maximum okay so I've come to the end of my very quick um, look at sunspots and cycles and what I want to um, also just take a minute to promote is my workshop um, next year in 2013 if you haven't heard in New York 18th and 19th of May that I'll be doing with um, Bill Meri Meridian slash Cerebi um, and we're really excited about it. We've got a lot to show and about what we both can do and um, what we found um, and it will be a very exciting two days um, full-on workshop. I've got some amazing stuff about cotton trades, GANS cotton trades that um, will be very eye-opening for all those who tend um, and lots of other things and I'm really looking forward to it so I hope you can come if you have any questions you can either contact me or Bill Meridian okay thank you